Hello everybody, this is Ezra Studios and today I've decided to do something a little bit different. One thing I have found quite a few of on the internet recently are videos that look at the differences between British and American terms. This includes numerous subjects such as food, clothes and cars or automobiles. But one thing I don't think I've seen too many of are videos that focus on trains and train terminology. So, what I've done is create this video, which I can use as two, as in this video I will be going through a variety of common train terms in both British and American English, and hopefully you might find this useful as well. So with that out of the way, it's time to begin our journey, so all aboard, sit back and enjoy the ride. To start with, we'll look at some of the basics. Trains, of course, need to run on tracks. A collection of tracks connected together is known in the UK as a railway. Whilst in America, you would call this a railroad. Of course, on a railway or railroad, you will have trains. In the UK and in the US, you would just call this a train. However, in the UK, this may also be known as a rake or a formation. And in America, you may also call this a consist. Now, of course, a train cannot move by itself, for that you need a form of motive power. In the UK, this is known as an engine. In America, an engine refers to the actual power source of the motive power. The machine as a whole is referred to as a locomotive, usually just shortened to loco. All engines or locomotives require someone in the cab to drive them. In the UK, this is quite simple, you just call it a driver. Steam engines will have an additional person on the footplate whose main responsibility is to ensure that the fire is burning nicely and the water pressure doesn't drop too low or get too high. The name of this position comes from their job role, stoking the fire. In the UK, you would call them a fireman. In America, you would call them a stoker. Now, of course, a train does not just exist of an engine or locomotive. It does require a way of transporting people and cargo around. The generic term for other items in a train in the UK would be rolling stock. Whilst in America, you would know these as cars. And, of course, there are many different types. Let's start by looking at how we transport people. Now, for the most part, most people will refer to the items used for transporting people as coaches. However, anybody who works on the railway will call this a carriage. In the UK, anyone working on the American Railroad will most likely refer to it as a passenger car. I think you may be able to see a pattern forming whilst we look at the other items of rolling stock or other cars. Now, of course, cargo cannot be transported in coaches, so for that, we need to use a different way of transporting them. In the UK, you would use goods wagons or trucks, as they make up a goods train. In America, you would refer to this as a freight train, made up of freight cars. And of course, there are many different types of good wagon or freight car. Perhaps one of the most common ones in the early days of the railway were open wagons. These were used to transport a wide variety of different types of cargo. In the UK, these open wagons are simply known as open wagons. If these wagons were made of wood, they were usually referred to as being a 3, 5 or 7 plank wagon, depending on how tall they were. However, metal wagons were designed initially for transporting heavier items such as coal, stone and minerals, hence why they were normally known as mineral wagons. Interestingly, in America, this particular type of freight car is known as a gondola. Now, there is one issue using open wagons, or gondolas, where cargo is left exposed to the elements. Some cargo needs to be kept covered, and you will do this in a more boxy appearing wagon or car. In the UK, for some reason, we call this a van. In America, we're a little more sensible and refer to it as a boxcar. 
Of course, vans or boxcars are not only used for transporting cargo. There are specially modified variants which are used for transporting livestock such as cows, sheep and pigs. These of course are known as either a cattle truck in the UK or a cattle car in the US. Longer items can also be transported by rail and for this they are usually placed on what is known in the UK as a flatbed, as it is a flatbed, or in the US you may refer to this as a flat car. Some heavier items however are used on another type of wagon or car which dips down in the middle a bit like a well, hence why it is known in the UK as a well wagon and in America a well car. However, seeing as these cars are usually used on intermodal trains, they are more commonly known in America as intermodal cars. Railways can also be used for transporting liquid chemicals, and usually do so in chemical tankers such as these, hence why they are usually known as tankers. However, in the UK they may also be known as a tank wagon, whilst in America you may call them a tank car. Finally, right at the very end of the train you will find another truck or car specifically to provide the train with additional braking, hence why in the UK it is called a brake van. However, since the guard is always positioned here, it is also known as a guards van. In America, you would refer to this car as a caboose. Now of course the guard is usually located in the guards van or in the caboose, and he or she is responsible for the whole train. In the UK, this person was known as a guard and on heritage railways still is known as a guard. But on the main rail network, they are slowly moving towards the more modern term, train manager. In America, you will more likely know a person in this position as a conductor. There are of course other members of staff that are important for a railway, many of which seem to have the same titles in both Britain and America but there are a few different ones, such as the person who is in charge of the station, in the UK this is known as a station master or a station mistress. Again, these terms are still used on heritage railways, but some companies operating on the main network have shifted to the American term station manager. Now of course trains need to run to time, and to help with this there is usually a timetable which tells passengers and staff where and when a certain train is supposed to be. In the UK we refer to a timetable simply as a timetable, though some people do like to call it a schedule. In America a timetable is known as a schedule, but for some reason they pronounce it schedule. Now of course if you want to ride on a train, one thing you will need is a ticket, and there are usually only two types. If you wish to travel from one place to another, you would get a single ticket in the UK, or in America you would ask for a one-way ticket. If however you want to go somewhere and then come back again, in the UK you would ask for a return ticket, whilst in America you would ask for a round trip. The one thing you do have to be wary of when operating a railway is when other methods of transportation need to cross the railway. This can be done using tunnels or bridges, but perhaps more commonly is done using a crossing. In the UK, you would call this a level crossing, as it is usually done on level ground. In America, the official name for this is a grade crossing, however almost everybody refers to it as a railroad crossing. Some crossings these days are automatic, others however are controlled by these tall boxy looking buildings found beside the line. These are also used for controlling signals. In the UK the boxy shape has earned it the name signal box, whilst in America its height above the line has earned it the name signal tower. Inside these buildings you will find an operator. In the UK this position was known as a signal man, and on heritage railways it still is a signal man, but on the main rail network they have progressed to the more modern term signaller. In America, meanwhile, they refer to this as a tower man. Now it's not just crossings and signals which can be controlled from a signal box or a signal tower. 
The other responsibility of a signalman or a tower man is making sure the trains are running on the correct track and sometimes switching them over. To do this, you would run them over what in the UK is known as a set of points. In America, this is called a switch track, though it's usually just shortened to switch. Now, sometimes you find yourself in a situation where one train needs to get past another, and there is a place that you can do that. A track that comes off the main line and rejoins it later down, allowing a train to pass, in the UK would be called a passing loop, although it is usually just shortened to loop. In America, you would call this a siding. In the UK, a siding is what's known as a track that comes off a line and ends at a dead end. In America, we call this a dead end. At the end of a siding or dead end, in the UK you're likely to find a buffer stop, also known as buffers. So named as they are usually built at buffer height and usually have buffers built into them. Now dead ends are a lot less common in America as are the idea of having stops at the end, but they do exist and they are known as bump stops or bumpers, although some states prefer to call them stubbing posts. The main use for sidings or dead ends is for rearranging wagons or cars, and this usually requires a special driver hired just for that particular job. In the UK, this person would be known as a shunter, as the duty is shunting, whilst in America, this person would be called a hostler. But it's not just the shunting driver that has a unique name. The engine or loco use for this task also has a unique name. In the UK, because they're used for shunting, they are known as a shunting engine, often shortened to shunter. In America, this operation is called switching, so a loco is known as a switching loco, often shortened to switcher. Now sometimes one engine or locomotive is not enough for a single train, and so sometimes additional engines or locos will be added to help, hence why in America they are known as helpers. In the UK, however, there are two terms depending on the engine's purpose. If the additional engine or loco is attached to the front of the train, then they are known as a pilot. If, however, they are attached at the rear, then they are known as a banker. Whilst this may be a British term, there are some steep grades in America where they do occasionally refer to these locos as bankers. It used to be quite common for engines or locomotives to be stored in a large wood or even brick building. These are known in the UK as sheds. In the US, these are known as barns. However, they are not particularly common, as in America, they seem to much prefer using a roundhouse. Now, naturally, an engine or loco, and of course, rolling stock and cars, cannot run forever. They do require maintenance at some point. This is usually carried out at a facility known as a workshop. However, in America, this is often shortened to just shops. They may also be known in America as a maintenance facility. In the UK, things are a little different. They are primarily known as workshops, regardless what you're using them for. But if they are specifically for the use of diesel or electric engines, then they're sometimes referred to as a depot instead. Of course, what would a workshop be without the workers? In the UK, this is known as an engineer, although if they're working specifically on a diesel or electric engine, they may also be known as a fitter. In America, this person will be known as a maintainer. Now, sometimes when an engine or locomotive needs to get from one place to another, it doesn't necessarily have a train to bring with it. This in the UK is known as running a light engine. However, in America, this would be known as running deadhead. However, the term deadhead can also be used in reference of a train made up of empty cars. A train of empty trucks such as this would be known in the UK as empty stock. There are various controls which are important for controlling a locomotive, and again, some of the names of these controls do vary from the UK to the US. The first one we're going to look at is this lever here, which is used to control a locomotive's speed. In the United States, this lever, no matter what loco it's attached to, is known as a throttle. In the UK, however, you would call this a regulator if it's attached to a steam engine, and a controller if it's attached to a diesel or an electric engine. 
The other key piece of equipment to keep in mind is a reverser, as this determines whether the locomotive or engine will be running forward or backwards. Earlier locomotive designs used a lever such as this, which in America got the nickname Johnson Bar. These were actually banned at some point during the 1930s, and all steam engines built afterwards required a screw reverser, as you can see here. Oddly enough, in the UK, this screw reverser somehow got the nickname Bacon Slicer. Another important piece of kit found on locomotives and rolling stock in most countries is a rubber pipe that runs along the length of the train. This is connected to the engine or locomotive which creates a vacuum which allows the brakes to come off. Then by adjusting the brake control you can let in more or less air to control how much the brakes come on. Because this is for the brakes, the people of the UK will call this a brake pipe, but seeing as it runs the full length of the train, Americans prefer to call it a train line. Now all engines do need to exhaust fumes of some description. On a steam engine, however, they have different names. In the UK, this is primarily known as a funnel, though some people call it a chimney. In America, however, they seem to prefer to call it a stack. The other thing we'll look at whilst we're talking about engines is articulated wheels. Most smaller engines or locomotives will have all the axles fixed in position parallel to the frame. However, larger locomotives will have some of their wheels, if not all of them, on articulated units. In America, an articulated unit is known as a truck. In the UK, it's a little more complicated than that. If it is a single axle, then it is known as a pony truck. However, if an articulated unit has two or more axles, then it is known as a bogey. Finally, the last piece of kit we'll look at is a way to attach a locomotive or engine to the rest of its train. This is done in the UK using a coupling, but in America they change it slightly to coupler. The UK primarily uses a system known as hook and chain, as you can see here. A hook and a three-piece chain attached from locomotive to rolling stock, or vice versa. In America, however, they prefer this knuckle-shaped coupler, hence why it is known as a knuckle coupler or a janny coupler. However, in the state of Ohio, it's called a buckeye coupler, hence why in the UK it's also known as a buckeye coupling. Now, something you may see in many cities around the world is an unusual type of engine or locomotive with covered wheels running along the road. In the UK, this is known as a tram. In America, if it is electrically powered, it's usually referred to as a trolley or a streetcar. However, some early designs were steam powered and these were known as steam dummies. A common sight for tram engines in the UK and most engines in America is a piece of metal or series of bars at the front of a locomotive or engine known as a cow catcher. This, of course, is to prevent any person or animal that is on the line from getting dragged under the wheels. Although some parts of America, you may also have this referred to as a pilot. Now, not all trains are able to run above ground. Some trains need to run under the ground, and most major cities have a rail network like this. In America, this is usually referred to as a subway, whilst in the UK it's normally known as an underground though some cities, like most of Europe, will call this a metro. And anyone who's ever been to London will know that people who live there affectionately call their underground rail system a tube. Now, sometimes you need to warn a driver or engineer about a potential hazard ahead, but without using a signal. So for this, you can sometimes use a small explosive device, which in the UK is called a detonator. In America, for some reason, you call this a torpedo. I always thought a torpedo was something fired by a submarine, not used to alert an engine driver, but what do I know? Now, tracks are made up of two primary components, obviously some smaller ones besides, but the two main ones are obviously rails, and the pieces are holding together. In the UK, this is known as a sleeper, or sleepers. In America, you would call this a tie, or ties. Originally, sleepers or ties were made of wood, 
though most railways these days make them out of concrete, and some even make them out of metal. Now of course a steam engine regularly needs to be topped up with water, and you will do this at a contraption known in both the UK and the US as a water tower. However, some people in the UK may call this a water column, while some Americans may call this a water plug. However, this was not the only way you could get water into a steam engine. Some railways or railroads were built with these long metal troughs which could be filled with water. The idea being that an engine or locomotive passed over them, it would drop a scoop into the water, scooping it up into the tender, and then would pull the scoop back up again before it reached the end of the trough. In the UK these were known as water troughs, whilst in America they were known as track pans. Now normally a railway track is built with two rails, however sometimes you will find them built with three, the third rail being a power source for electric locomotives or electric engines. Now in both the UK and the US these are known as third rails, although the technical terms are conductor rail in the UK and power rail in the US. And this brings us to the end of our discussion about train terms in both the UK and the US. However, I do have a few bonus terms which aren't actually anything to do with a railway, but may be commonly used by people working for the railway, or visiting railways or whatever. Now as I said earlier, cargo in the UK would be transported by rail in trucks. In America, a truck is a road-going vehicle for transporting cargo, whilst in the UK this would be known as a lorry, although some people do still use the term truck. Now, trucks these days, or lorries, primarily run on diesel fuel, however, some, and most cars or automobiles, run on what is known in the UK as petroleum, however, this is almost always shortened to petrol. In America, this is known as gasoline, however, this is almost always shortened to gas. One of the common minerals or metals that will be transported by rail in the UK is known as aluminium, whilst in America you would pronounce it aluminum. And finally, railways can also be used for transporting letters and parcels. In the UK, this would be known as post, transported on a post train or in a post van. In America, this would be known as mail, transported in a mail train or a mail truck. Now, of course, you also need people to deliver post or mail, and this person would be known as a postman or a mailman. And so that brings us to the end of our video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this content, then please like, subscribe, and share this video. I'll see you again soon.